One more time, a little more stuff. It's been a great day, and again, being in that sanctuary again was such a rich experience for me, and being in the with the congregation, and my goodness, it was, my Lord, what a morning. We almost broke in and sang that, because it was, it was like Easter for me. Um, it's just an, a rich and amazing thing to get to come back home to a place where you have started and been before, and you know, I used to think there were a lot of older people at First Pres when I was here at 27, and I've kind of revised some of my way of thinking about that now, because uh, I really thought Lewis was extremely old when he was 47 and I got here, and I thought, I have never worked with anybody that old. <laughs> and now 47 sounds really young to me. And so it's just a matter of perspective. Well, many of you have been here at some of the other events. I will give you just a couple of things about family. I don't, I don't have them in this slideshow, but Sarah is a pastor and working full time, and she was working today. And today they were having George Whitfield Sunday in her church. So she was in a colonial dress uh, today, and a guest speaker was um, Reverend Whitfield, but she was kind of playing the part of people who were there. So Whitfield established the church in 1740, had a long-time relationship with the church, and actually died two doors down from the church uh, in 1770. So he was one of the preeminent evangelists of the First Great Awakening, a contemporary of John and Charles Wesley. And one of the things that I'll just give you a little musical aside in case you want it. Um, the hymn that we sing at Christmas, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, is a Wesley hymn. It was written by Wesley. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Well, that first way Wesley wrote it was not that way. It had the word Wilkin in it. It was a really unusual thing. And Whitfield saw it and said, they'll never sing it that way. No, I want it that way. And Whitfield said, well, every time I use it, I'm going to sing it a different way. And so Whitfield actually came up with the first phrase, Hark the Herald. So if you look in a hymn book, you'll see uh, Charles Wesley and then altered, but it doesn't have Whitfield's name in it, but he's the one that altered that hymn and made it a little bit different. So Sarah's in that church, and as I said, Whitfield is buried directly underneath her pulpit. Uh, which is just an unusual custom. I mean, there are lots of European churches where people are buried underneath in the crypt, but not usually right in a pulpit so that, you know, if you kind of get off track, you hear this thing turning over in the grave underneath <laughs> your very feet. There are two other pastors buried under there as well. And when you go down and visit it, they've got a replica of his skull sitting on, on top. So we take children down there, and it kind of frights them, you know, and they <laughs> enjoy this a lot. <clears throat> Our son James, who grew up in this church uh, and run around in this church with Katie Skates and got in trouble with Katie Skates a lot, um, is now in New York City uh, working at Bloomberg Business Weekly. And he's got a wife and two little children one of whom he was determined to name for Olive Davis, partly because Hallie Davis was his primary babysitter, and he just was has been curious about that name Olive along. So now we have an Olive Singleton who is now eight years old, and that's kind of dear, and we are proud of our connection to the Davis family on that one. Esther is the Esther Claire is the other daughter, and she is four. Rachel lives in Colorado Springs, and long story about Rachel, but we are raising her son, Hunter, who is almost four, but still three. So Sarah and I, in our 60s, have an everyday uh, grandchild in our home that we are raising, and it's a phenomenal experience. You just sometimes get a hand dealt to you in the providence of God that you were not planning on, but once it is there, you begin to see God's wonders in it, and we're at that place. We just regard it as a privilege to be in this place, and we are permanent guardians of him, and so I may have to work forever, uh, and so we'll just do it that way. But all is well in the Singleton house, and living in Boston is not home, and I regularly tell Sarah, please don't bury me here. I Take me home to Texas to bury, because I'm just not sure I can do it. So... 
We've tried to talk last night about what part of the Reformation was actually not just a great idea about how we would get back on track biblically and spiritually, but how the Reformation actually evolved into a movement. And I was borrowing a five-fold way of thinking that comes actually from Dick Halverson. It really comes from a sociological way of understanding how people move and change. But Dick Halverson coined it in alliterative terms. He said it actually begins with a man. It gathers a bunch of men. It then becomes a movement. And then if it's not challenged, it will become a monument. And if the monument is left in its monument stage, it will become a museum. Now, of course, we want to update the language and say men or women, man or woman. But what he's trying to say is that when God begins to do something new, it just doesn't drop out of heaven, extranos. It comes through people. That God moves one and then two and then three and then four with a, an idea that comes out of a similar context and comes through a set of circumstances and coalesces in something that you would call a movement. And so when you think of the 18th century and John and Charles Wesley and this Whitfield that's buried underneath our church, that was the Wesleyan movement. And it began with a few people in Oxford praying that God would help renew the church, and they didn't quite know how to do it, and they formed what was called the Holy Club, which didn't attract that many members, actually. Uh, but it was sort of an idea of we want to be a little different than just the dry, ordinary, formal Church of England that was going on during that time. But it coalesced with some movements in North America with Jonathan Edwards and Gilbert Tennant and Jonathan Dickinson, and it became a transatlantic movement known as the First Great Awakening. And when it became a movement, it actually moved churches to become alive in a way they had not been. Now, that's what Luther was doing, along with Calvin, along with Knox, along with Zwingli, and a host of others in the 16th century when this thing you're going to be studying this fall, the Reformation, came to pass. Probably two key ingredients I reviewed last night is the rediscovery of the Word of God and the amazing technological transmission of the Word of God. Because prior to the Reformation, the only Bibles anybody had were copied by Brother Dominic, who later starred on the Xerox commercial, uh, copying very painstakingly. And so any copied version of scripture was incredibly expensive. And only people like cardinals and archbishops had copies of them. So nobody had a copy in their house. Nobody had one on their living room table. So do you realize we had a whole expression of the Christian faith and nobody's reading the word. The Thursday morning women's Bible study at First Pres. San Antonio would have never happened because there was nothing to read. And when Luther is assigned to begin teaching Bible in a seminary and sees what's in the book, it overwhelms him. And he gathers others around him. Look at this. Look at this. Look what this says. And it began to cause a chain reaction and it just so happened that this new idea had come to pass just decades after the Gutenberg Press came to be. So everything they had, we started having cheap Bibles for the first time ever. And lots of biblical books would be in what you would call pamphlet form. So people would get a free copy, practically, of the Gospel of Mark or something. And, and things Luther wrote that were very provocative were all printed and distributed all over Europe. And so very quickly, a movement coalesced around the significance of the word of God. 
in the middle of one of Luther's moments that he didn't really plan on being in when he had to go into hiding in the Wartburg Castle, he actually translated from the Greek into German a almost a living Bible version of the German Bible. And when that got in everybody's hands, suddenly they could understand what had not been understood. The translation was more accurate than the previous one from the Latin. And it, the Bible is really what ignited that amazing journey. Now, in periods of church history since, what you discover is that Christians kind of get lazy about the Bible. The average American Christian right now actually owns, if you can imagine this, I think it's eight Bibles per household. Now, let's see the hands of those for whom there are, in fact, eight Bibles in your house. Let me see those. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Most people who hang around Presbyterian churches are going to have eight different versions and hardcover and softcover and ones where you can take notes and not take notes and all kinds of... We, we now have the note taker's Bible in the pew in, at Gordon Conwell, but they really don't want anybody to take notes in them because they're the pew Bibles. And it's very ironic. Um, there was once a lady in my, in my church in Spokane who I, I preached on bringing your Bible to church and because all this and, and mystified her. And, and so at the worship committee meeting on Monday night, they asked me, now, why did you preach that weird sermon yesterday about bringing Bibles to church. And I said, well, it's just so good to carry your own Bible. And I said, whoa, 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 Jim, that's why we became Presbyterian. Baptists carry big Bibles to church. We use the Bibles that are in the pew. And I said, but, but what you really need to do is bring your own Bible so you can make notes in the margin about things I say so that next time you read it in your devotions, you'll actually remember. It's for, so you can take notes. And this dear woman who became a great friend said, oh, I just hadn't heard anything in your preaching I'd want to take a note on yet. <laughs> that said, Scripture Falling in love with the scripture is something Protestants have at our core, and yet we get kind of lazy about it at points. And so that's where that Reformation comes back. And we think, you know, am I reading the book? Is the book reading me? And the second thing was salvation by grace alone. And last night I did lots of discussion of things like indulgences and reminding us that's where our salvation comes from. And it's a perennial plant that comes up every year in your soul that the minute you get grace, you use it like, kind of like something you would borrow temporarily until your life is so good you can earn it. And then you feel better about yourself. And the Protestant urge is to never take that as a loan, but it's a gift. And your salvation from the first day to the last day is actually going to be so needful for you. So I, I ended up preaching a great sermon at Union Seminary for my senior sermon. It, I, I really preached it at pitiful, lackadaisical, sloppy seminary students, and I just went after them. It was, I wanted to take notes on myself that day. It was that good. <laughs> of a sermon, but it was kind of a tough one to listen to. You know, there were a lot of shoulds and oughts in it. And when I sat down, the old preaching professor who was named Welford Hobby, he didn't even know what to say about such a mean-spirited sermon. And so he said this, Jim, why is it that old preachers like to preach on grace and young preachers like to preach on sin. Why is that? And you know what I said at Union Seminary? I said, because old preachers have gotten soft in their old age. And he said, well, you think about that. And I've thought about that a lot of years. And now I know why old preachers preach on grace. Because we are desperate for it. 
We have, I thought by the time I was 61, I would be so holy that you could lay sick people down in my shadow and they would be healed. <laughs> but it has not turned out that way. I am actually a little worse than I was at 27, or maybe a lot worse. So the other Reformation principle is stick to grace. So turn to your neighbor and go, don't let go of grace. Tell them, tell them, tell them. Okay, now let's do a little more, and I want to talk about another movement. That was the movement in the 16th century. I've mentioned movements in the 18th century. What's the movement God is beginning to do in this 21st century? You've already joined ECO. ECO is a group of congregations, and they are determined and have been since the beginning to remain a movement. They actually wanted to be not another institution, but they wanted to be a group of congregations who would be a movement together defined by a few things. Now, it's not easy to pull this off. And I said last night, every movement will find it easier to be what you're against than what you're for. So it doesn't mean this has happened, but this is kind of a chronology. 2010, a few pastors start dreaming of a different way to be. That we actually had a planning meeting in, believe it or not, Ron Skate's office in Highland Park Presbyterian to think, how could this come to be? In the summer of 2011, we had a launch meeting in Minneapolis. By January of 2012, a denomination was invented that had nobody in it. It was just a, a, an empty warehouse. And by May of 2012, the first congregation started stepping into this. And 2015, San Antonio First Pres enters in. Now, this movement, again, is, is, is coming with attention because you're trying to get out of something old that you thought was binding you and step into something new. And so at one level, it feels merely like a transactional kind of thing. Okay, we're going to put one uniform aside. We're going to quit looking like the Houston Astros, and now we're going to look like the Texas Rangers. We got traded. Well, it's not that simple. It's about becoming something different. So here's the mission statement that ECO designed, and I want you to notice very carefully what it's saying. This mission of ECO, a covenant order of evangelical Presbyterians, is to build flourishing churches, flourishing congregations that make disciples of Jesus Christ. That's the simple form. That's what we're trying to do. Now, that means there are two pieces of that. Oh, this is going to suck. No, I think I skipped one. No, there we go. Boom. Come back, come back, come back. The, the values of ECO were designed to be that we will have a Jesus-shaped identity as a movement, that we will live in the midst of a biblical integrity, meaning we're interpreting Scripture in integrity with it, with the rest of itself, we're going to craft a thoughtful theology that allows us to reclaim the best of the reform heritage. We're going to live in an accountable community where somebody else is going to ask us, are you getting sloppy or are you moving forward? This is actually a piece that comes out of the Wesleyan way of having a movement. We value egalitarian ministry, which means the ministry of men and women in ministry together. Ooh, this thing just jumps and skips and goes. There we go. And, and other parts of these values mean we're looking at becoming missional as congregations, living into a way of accelerating those who can get into leadership in this world rather than waiting uh, uh, for so long to be involved in a much larger denomination and, and many other values. Now, right now... ECO has five great emphases, here are three, to be, move from being a clergy-centered movement to unleashing laity, moving from safety and preservation to risk-taking and expansion, moving, from, uh, moving to prepare all God's people for a post-Christian culture. Now, I want you to notice that last one, preparing people for a post-Christian culture culture. That means that the assumption is we no longer live in a Christian culture. Now, all of us are very slow in coming to grips with that. Aren't we going to get that back? Can't we find it again? But pretty much every trend line I've shown elders over the weekend and showed some last night, that's the reality of the world we're in. 
it's hard to be in that reality because none of us were actually trained to live for Christ in a post-Christian culture. Europe's been doing that for a much longer period than us. We've still got lots of vestiges where the culture is more Christian, but really this part of Texas is not one of those. We are not in high numbers in terms of San Antonio, certainly not Austin. Uh, some of the higher numbers are in places east of here. But, you know, this is a, a, an area that if the next generations are not evangelized and not brought into discipleship, we won't make it. So to build flourishing congregations, you've got to center them on Christ and his grace. Fruit of the Spirit's got to be present. There's got to be some relationships of vulnerability and encouragement. And then if we're going to have a clear focus on building mature disciples of Jesus, does every congregation actually have a plan for how we're going to do that, building disciples? Now, a disciple, according to two authors I use, is someone who's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to Jesus' kingdom mission. That's a disciple. That's a big definition of a disciple. You're following Jesus. You're being changed by Jesus. You're moving from something to something. You know, when, P when Jesus met the person we call Peter, he was going by another name. He was going by the name of Simon. You are Simon, son of John. You're going to be, you're going to be Peter. You're going to be Cephas was the Hebrew version of that. You're going to be a rock. You're going to move from this to this. So that means that part of the Christian life is every one of us in this room is designed to be on a journey from something to something. But many of us have kind of decided instead of going all the way to Houston on I-10, let's just go about halfway. Let's just go to Seguin and call it good. We don't really need to go all the way down that road. And so you find a number of us, me included, are stunted in the spiritual growth we've enjoyed. We've just not gone as far as we were destined to go. We've made kind of a treaty with the Canaanites in our own soul, and we said, oh, y'all can stay. That's fine. And, and in so doing, we've missed some of what Jesus had for us. Now, disciple is that definition. So discipleship is an intentional process of investing in a life-on-life -life relationship where the person of Christ and the values of the kingdom are being formed and reproduced in another life. So Paul tells to Timothy, what you've heard and seen in me, I want you to pass on to another person who will in turn teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2 presupposes a multiplication of disciples. A multiplication and yet most of us in especially American Presbyterianism have decided we can do that more efficiently in organized big events where you can teach in a broadcast way. And if you get in a Sunday school class or a big Bible study, you'll grow real fast as a disciple. And what we tend to find, where's that next one? I may need a little help. This thing is, start, there we go. Uh, we find that this has actually become a lost art. Leroy Imes years ago wrote a book called The Lost Art of Disciple Making. Most of us have wanted an institution to do that. And we've assumed if we signed up for a particular class, it was going to happen. Most of what happens in a class is your mind gets some data added to it. But to let what you just learned about the Christian life seep into your soul and particularly your will, Calvin was very interested in how the will is being shaped, you usually need somebody to be able to talk to about that in smaller groups that can hold you accountable and be relationally vulnerable. This book and much of the literature today is speaking about how important it's going to be for a church in a post-Christian culture to return to either one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two or one-on-three Disciple making. Right now, there is a book on discipleship that comes out every two weeks. People are writing more on discipleship in 2017 than they have written in my whole lifetime because 
to do a missional church and speak to a non-Christian, post-Christian context, we actually have to know our faith. So Dallas Willard says that non-discipleship is actually the elephant in the church. It's, it's not the many moral failures, financial abuses, or amazing general similarity between Christians and non-Christians. Those are only the effects of the fact that we have not been discipled. So if a movement is going to start that's going to re-equip the church to be a flourishing congregation making disciples in the midst of a post-Christian world, we actually might need a different approach than the one we have so faithfully tried. Discipleship is a deep process. It's affecting belief. That means our head. It's affecting behavior. That means our will. It's affecting belonging to the people of God, which is our heart. The early church took three years to disciple a person. Three years. And we typically do it in a couple of weeks. When I got here, we did not have a new member class. I asked Lewis if we could have it. He took a dim view of that and didn't want me to do it. And we finally got four weeks of a new member class. And I was so proud that we had taken this step. David Youngquist was right there with me, and we did all these new member classes. I think we expanded it at one point to six. But that's a long way from three years. Three years is what the early church did because they were coming from a completely pagan culture. So when you met Christ, you, had, you knew nothing. We know something, but we don't know as much as we used to know. In fact, tell your neighbor that right now. You don't know as much as you used to know. So a missional church, which is what ECO is wanting us to be as a value, a missional church is a reproducing community of authentic disciples being equipped as missionaries sent by God to live and proclaim his kingdom in their world. So you see, what that's got to start with is one or two saying, I think I'll do it. And then they begin to work with two or three others and they go, well, we'll do it too. So I've been discipling people every year since 1981, and my condition is I'll walk with you for a year if you'll walk with somebody the next year. And it works imperfectly. It hasn't been a, a stunning, constant success, but it's been an amazing investment in people. So we've got a competing value. We want to build disciples who make disciples, and we also want the freedom to be consumers who drop in and out when we want to. And see, there's a competing value there. What do we really want the church to become? How do we want to live? What is our calling? We want a flourishing congregation, yippee, but we don't want any changes to have that come about. Oh, so that's a competing value. And one of the hardest things about leadership in any organization is coming face to face with your competing values and putting them in conversation with each other until they sand each other down and a consensus emerges about how we do that. As long as we're not in that sanding process, we'll just say, well, you know, that's a good idea, but we're going to do this idea because we've got another value. And one of the issues in churches is how hard it is to let our values begin to change. A woman told me in Colorado Springs, I understand exactly what you're trying to do with this church. I actually think it's a good idea. I've got one request. I said, what's that? Could you wait until I die to do these things? <laughs> Now, I laughed. I thought she was kidding. She was not kidding. She was a general's wife and was used to getting her way, and so she really expected we would postpone this thing 10 years. Um, but Halverson's stages, again, are it begins with a few people who contagiously reach a few people until that becomes a movement reaching a number of people and then once it's a movement, it's going to have to get some form to it at some point. We call that institutionalization. But the danger at that point is that it becomes a monument to the way it used to be. And we can't do that because that's not the way Tom Binky used to do it. You know, we have to do it the way he did it. And, and, and if it doesn't get another smack of a movement at that point, then it will be on its way to becoming a museum. And a museum is what you become when you remember what used to be. We are closing 97 PCUSA churches every year, many years over 100. We've gotten a little better lately because there are not that many to close anymore. We used to have 11,000. Now we've got 9,500, so the numbers are fewer. But we've averaged about 105 churches closed every year. 
And you know what those buildings are used for now? Some are restaurants, some are bars, some are bought by growing churches. Some of those have become homes. The church that is nearest the seminary where I teach in Boston is a private residence. They've converted the church into a private residence. So we've got a lot of museums going on. And the church my father pastored, as I mentioned last night, is literally a museum. It was in Anson, Texas, north of Abilene, First Presbyterian Church. And in 1985, nobody was left. So they gave it to uh, the county to be used as the Jones County Museum. It was a vibrant church as recently as World War II. So we've got to think, okay, what can we do? Movements emerge when somebody's got a white-hot faith that gets people fired up and enlists commitment to a cause and begins to establish a bunch of courageous relationships and it becomes then rapidly mobile where you can touch one and then touch another and touch another and you keep looking for ways to adapt to make that thing work. So I want to just leave you with the image today that to do a reformation and to do what goes on in a reformation again, it's going to have to have the power of a movement. And movements are most naturally affected in places where the relationships are close enough to be contagious, meaning it's easier to have a movement in a congregation than it is to have a movement nationally. And the movement I'm suggesting is that we begin to disciple people in how to read the Word of God and that you read the Word of God with people on a weekly basis on what they've been reading all week long. So my strategy has always been to help people fall in love with reading Scripture, discover by reading Scripture that they are God's child, and let their life begin to change. And it's a very simple model, so simple that you can have rather rapid mobilization. I just ask people to read three chapters of Mark with me every week, about half a chapter a day, maybe a third of a chapter, write down in a journal what they're reading, and we'll talk about it every Tuesday, and we'll find out what was God doing as you were reading Mark's gospel. It takes a long time to get in the habit of reading Scripture every day. Most Christians read it occasionally, but we have a hard time reading it daily because it's a habit, and it's a habit that does not always give you a nice feedback loop. Anything you do that has a nice feedback loop, you'll do again. You know, if you go to a movie and you go, I like that, I think I'll go to another movie. That was fun. Let's do it again. If I read Scripture and it was... A, and it was the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1. And I go, well, that wasn't so exciting. I don't know if I want to do that tomorrow. And then you read tomorrow, and it's a little more genealogy. Uh, I don't know about that. And so this is not really firing me up. But if you can read it with somebody, and you know somebody's going to check on you on Tuesday, you begin to think, well, maybe I'll keep reading. And by the time you get to chapter 2, it gets good. And chapter 3, it's better. In chapter 4, you're in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, and you go, I know about Now I'm knowing about this. And, you know, this is kind of a feedback loop. But you need somebody to help you. It's like exercise. If you go exercise the first day and you go, my goodness, that was horrible. I feel sore all over. It's going to take me a week to recover from that before I can go to the gym again. But, you know, Ron Skates goes to a gym six days a week because he's found a feedback loop that he actually gets energy from doing that. It gives him more epinephrine and he just kind of gets fired up. He met me yesterday. He was still sweating like a dog, but he was he'd come right from the gym and he was full of life. That's a feedback loop. Disciples need somebody to walk with them and urge them in scripture. So my urge to you today is if you want to get this church prepared to face a post-Christian world the movement that's going to need to become is the grand old Reformation movement of falling in love with the text and perhaps learning to read it with somebody. So if you need to have kind of a, a course that would clear up what has missed in the years past, maybe you want to say, Ron, Bob, could you do some of this with me and I'll do it with somebody next year and then find three or four others. David Youngquist knows how to do this. Can I... And, and, it doesn't take that many years to multiply rapidly into a church. And then it begins to change the way we begin to look at our relation to this world around us. And we begin to know scripture well enough that we're able to talk about our faith and become a missional church. So I'm going to invite you in the name of the history of the Reformation 
to continue to think about what Reformation is needed here right now. The typical Presbyterian churches, if you've got a thousand people in worship, the typical church has actually less than 200 in an active adult education plan, meaning they're not in a Sunday school. Some churches are a little higher, some are a little lower, but it's about 20% take the second step because then I've got to stay at church two hours and there's, who wants to stay at church downtown two hours? And if I have to come down here Wednesday night, it's just coming downtown Wednesday night in San Antonio, you know, it's kind of a hassle, traffic at 5.30. Are you starting to hear the amen? The feedback loop says, you know, I might just stay home tonight and watch reruns of Friends or reruns of something because maybe... I, but you can get together with one person very rapidly who might live near you and have the word of God get in you in a deep way. And I'd be happy to send Ron and Bob, others, any reading plan. But you've had reading plans for scripture a long time. What you need is accountability to help you do it and get into it in a deep way, a movement. Now, if you don't want to have a movement, it's okay. And I showed a picture yesterday to the elders of a dog lying on a porch. Like, I think I've got that old dog way back. Let me do, 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 do. Let me show you. This is the, I'll end with this cute little dog. Because this little dog, uh, this little dog is, come on, come on, come on. Come on, this thing's getting tired. Maybe it's me. I'm um, getting tired. There's my dog. Okay, now that dog is lying on the front porch. And a pastor was visiting his congregant who lived at this house on this porch and they were sitting in those rocking chairs on the front porch, and he was just having a little bit about how's your life, how are things going. And the dog was whining. And it was a pitiful whine. He was just lying there whining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was a little distracting to have a conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. And finally, the pastor got annoyed enough. He said, why is your dog whining? And the man at home said, oh, really not much. Not much wrong with that dog. That dog is just lying on a nail. And it hurts him enough to whine, but it doesn't hurt him enough yet to move. <laughs> and I find many churches are at that point. We're kind of struggling with not enough people here. The program life of the attractional church in most churches is having a struggle time to get people involved. People's lives are busy, busier. How are we going to get a group equipped to go into a post-Christian mission field on the diet that we are serving? How are we going to do this? It's going to take discipleship. That's what writer after writer after writer is saying today. If we're going to get this thing equipped, we're going to have to get off the nail and get much more serious about producing disciples. And that can happen in differing ways in differing congregations. But my urge is that this become a passion for this church to be able to be the kind of church that has an effect because the old days, you waited until people showed up here at the church. And as I said at the 11 o'clock service, you kind of herded them into the church. Yeehaw, yeehaw, get in there, little doggies, little doggies, little doggies. And then finally, you would get them, and then Louis Sabendon would brand them. Psst, FPC. Psst. But, you know, that model is not working because millennials are not showing up at churches anymore. You can't herd them in because church is not... I, try, I met a woman from Toronto not long ago, and she said, you're a pastor. That is so weird. <laughs> what do you do? And she said, we, we got to talking, she said, you know, I don't, I don't, this was a very bright woman, uh, vice president of Canadian Tire Company. She says, I, I actually don't know anybody in my social circle that goes to church or ever did. I can't even imagine what goes on there. Now, do you think she's just going to come visit First Presbyterian? No. It's a different culture. But that culture is creeping into this one. So to be ready, how are we going to do it? And this finally concludes. 
uh, is a picture of my dad's church in Anson, Texas that now has antique farm equipment in the sanctuary. Antique farm equipment and old quilts are there. That's what you get for being a museum. We'd never want to do that. This is a culturally different moment than we've ever been in before. And it's easy to complain about, oh, the church, the church, the church. Eco wants you to become a movement. They want to baptize more people than they bury. They want to become a movement of congregations that begin to reach lost people through thoroughly discipling their members. So I'll stop there, answer any questions you've got, or if it's getting too close to your nap, uh, some, a couple of you started on it in here. I saw that. And that. But I can let you go home where you can actually stretch out and enjoy your nap. Question right here. <clears throat> yes. I did. Yes. I have not heard in your congregation yet one word of the Spirit, nor have I in the common soul much about the Holy Spirit. Okay. If we have a re reformation, it's going to have to be triggered by the Holy Spirit. Exactly. And the Holy Spirit is the one that actually makes the Word of God come alive. So when the Holy Spirit is present, that's when the Spirit speaks through the word in ways that change and move us. And absolutely, some of my African students have told me it is amazing what your American churches get done without using the Holy Spirit. It's just really phenomenal how much you get done because we would never get that done in Africa apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, that can manifest itself in a lot of ways. I said Pentecostalism is one of the fastest growing movements, the fastest growing religious movement in the world, soon to be a billion people who are Pentecostal. Uh, and we have criticism sometimes with Presbyterians and that, but it is a Holy Spirit-driven movement. And discipleship cannot really happen unless the Holy Spirit is the engine of that. And Calvin is really the theologian of the Holy Spirit. So I will say amen to Holy Spirit. Other questions? Question, David West. You can. Um, actually, it is more likely that a person would want to be and of course, the, the more business term is mentored. People are liking being mentored in business. And if uh, Natasha Robinson has a book called the Discipleship as Mentoring, people would be ready to actually read scripture with you once a week more often than they would be willing to come visit a church. We often think they wouldn't, we wouldn't want to ask them because they're not church members. But it's amazing how many people are open to doing that. Now, the feedback loop might not be profound enough to keep them doing it, but it might well be. And over time, they get very interested in what's in the Word, and the Holy Spirit uses the Word to actually bring them to faith. So if you've got somebody in your office who at least looks like they might be receptive, I think you could offer to disciple them or mentor them in some spiritual things, and would they be interested in just reading this book with you? And they might be. But we often think we wouldn't ask them. So it's one of those conduits that begin a process. And again, the early church, in some ways, was doing pre-discipleship, pre-conversion. They were beginning to disciple people in relationships before they had even actually made a decision to follow Christ. But so many people don't know what's in the book. So I'll send some titles to Bob and Ron that you can at least see some of the books that are written on discipleship and what's going on in this. Rick. Yes. 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 
Well, white hot passion is what comes out of an encounter with the word and the spirit that finally ignites me to be more than isn't that interesting. Because what we often do with a Bible study or with a sermon is, hmm, that's fascinating. And then we just kind of go ruminate on it or forget it by the time we get to the car. But a white hot passion means something is ignited in me. Something is ignited in my life that is coming from the Holy Spirit and begins to cause me to realize this worldview in Scripture is different than what's being offered outside here. Ron told me years ago about a parable of Kierkegaard where Kierkegaard talked about the devil as a thief in a jewelry store. And so the thief goes into the jewelry store, but he actually doesn't steal anything. He just rearranges the value, rearranges all the price tags so that what's cheap looks expensive, what's expensive looks cheap. And that's the difference in a biblical worldview and a secular worldview is that the things we value have now become different and the process of growing as a disciple is putting the right value, the right price tag on the right value. So the early church was instructed that part of the life you're going to live is you're going to take care of poor people. That's what Christians do. That's the essence of a Christian faith. Now, this church has worked hard through the years, largely under Lewis's leadership, to think about ways of how do we bless the city of San Antonio by taking care of the poor. That's biblical worldview. The biblical worldview begins to understand how we value children and how we value children as heirs of the kingdom of God. And it, it helps us understand how we value human life and how we value the kind of sexual life God has called us to live. I mean, there are all kinds of biblical worldviews. And we're sometimes in debate with the society about those things, and it becomes kind of confusing. So great question there. How about one more and then nap time? Sandy. I do. I don't know if it will be as painful as it is in some ways. So Sandy's question was, do, we think, do I think persecution will come to Christians in America? I don't know that it'll be the same painful. My, again, my Chinese students have told me this. When you go through their new member class, and especially when you go through their elder training, part of their curriculum is, what do you do when the police arrest you? I'm going, woo, that'll get the riffraff out. I mean, you know, that's a different way of doing elder training. What do you do when they're going to arrest? And one of my favorite students, Abraham Lewis, spent three years under arrest just for being a pastor. And they do this episodically and put people in jail. And they would claim, and the early church would claim, that's one of the marks of Christian witness. So one could argue, and my Chinese students do, American Christianity would do better if they were actively persecuted. Now, I'm not really ready to sign up for that, kind of like that general's wife. I hope that happens after I die instead of before I die, but if it does, and it may well happen. And you're finding lots of persecution in Northeastern universities for any Christian group on campus. It has gotten way difficult to have any Christian group present on campus in any kind of official way. You can meet, but not on any school property. Um, graduation in my local town of Ipswich happened at 10 o'clock Sunday morning this year because that nobody needs to go to church, so we'll put graduation at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. So there, even in Virginia, some counties had churches were all mailed property tax bills that were stamped, you don't have to pay it, but we want you to see it. Now that's the prelude for one day property tax coming to a church. So I think persecution may well come, and I just don't know that we've all gotten really cognizant of we're in a different culture. We're gonna have to have a different way of being prepared. All right, I'll stop there. Oh, we had one last one back here. Yes. Yeah. I have to, both would be there. And I think by being discipled, you would see that that's the natural call of the Christian. What many are afraid of doing getting out there is we're not prepared about what to say, and so discipleship gives you an equipping 
what to say, but the early church had probably its greatest witness at the time when Rome would have plagues and Christians got out and took care of sick people and really ministered to them. And so I think it's interesting that a hurricane comes along and I've got a friend who's working in Houston and he's only, only, only mobilizing his ministry to take care of Muslim widows in Houston so that every work camp goes to f help the homes of Muslim widows to let them know Christians care. That's getting out in a little different way. Thank you for letting me be with you this day and yesterday, and I love it. I don't want to leave.